Shock absorbers do more than just make your ride smoother. They counteract the bounce when you hit a bump, holding your tires to the road. Without that traction, you'd lose control. So by affecting steering, stopping, and stability, shocks are actually a vital safety component. Wheel vibrations cause a piston inside the shock absorber to force oil through a valve. This absorbs energy, dampening the vehicle's bounce. All this happens within the shock's two tubes, the reserve tube, and inside it, the pressure tube, housing the piston rod and compression valve. The factory makes both these tubes from a steel sheet sliced into strips. Inside this tube mill, coolant prevents the passing strip from overheating as one forming roller after another gradually rounds it into a tube. Then a copper welding wheel fuses the tube closed. As the five and a half meter long tube comes off the mill, a cutting tool chops it into shock absorber lengths. The tube making process is the same for the reserve and pressure tubes, except that the reserve tubes undergo one extra step, compressing the ends. This enables the shock to house a larger reserve tube that can hold more oil. The reserve tube's final stop is a press. A die inside stamps the part number, the manufacturing date and the brand name. Many components are made of powdered metal, mostly iron powder mixed with some graphite and copper. After a press compacts the powder in a die, a furnace fuses the particles. This powdered metal part is the valve through which the piston forces the oil. Steel discs and a spring help control the speed with which the valve operates for varying driving conditions. A stamping tool crimps the end of the tube holding the spring in position. The valve, now fully assembled, seals the bottom of the pressure tube. Meanwhile, a press punches round steel discs into other components. These loops mount the shock absorber to the vehicle. A worker positions a cup on each one, then a robot welds them together. They insert a cup and mount unit on one end of the reserve tube, then weld it on. This unit is called the base assembly. The base assemblies now go on a conveyor, open end up, so that workers can drop a pressure tube inside each one. Automated injectors now fill it with oil that's specially designed to maintain its consistency despite changes in temperature. Next comes the head assembly. That includes the steel piston rod and the mount on the other end of the shock absorber. Two copper welding wheels fuse the head assembly to the base assembly with a cap. This closes the unit, sealing the oil inside. Next, they weld on a dirt shield, a steel casing that prevents dirt from hindering the movement of the piston rod. Now they press a bushing into each mount. This helps tone down the vibrations coming from the vehicle. Now it's onto an automated carousel. Robots pierce a hole in each shock and inject nitrogen gas to prevent the oil inside from foaming. After injection, the robot seals the hole by welding on a tiny steel ball. And now for the finishing touch, an electrostatic paint job. A machine runs a positive electrical current through the shocks and a negative one through the paint particles. Like a magnet, the static electricity draws the paint onto the shocks in a flawless coat. In the factory's quality control lab, technicians use sophisticated equipment to evaluate how well a shock dampens movement at different speeds. The tube and valve configuration inside varies by vehicle, so the shocks on a ground-hugging sports car are quite different from those on a luxury sedan, 
or on a rugged light truck. Pistons are key to the internal combustion process that drives engines. A piston is a plug that slides up and down inside each engine cylinder, compressing gas and air ignited by a spark plug. The resulting energy turns the crankshaft and drives the engine. This company makes 9,000 different types of pistons for everything from dirt bikes to car engines. A piston starts out as a three meter long aluminum rod. Aluminum is ideal because it's a lightweight and rust resistant metal that's easy to cut. A rotary saw slices the rod into slugs, the length of which can be changed by adjusting the feeder machine to push the rod at different intervals. This piston model requires seven centimeter slugs. The factory recycles excess aluminum shavings. The punch, press and die are preheated to 426 degrees Celsius, the temperature required to forge the slugs. The slugs are brought to the same temperature in an oven. The punch applies 2,000 tons of pressure to form it into the initial shape of the piston. He dunks about 1 in 10 forgings in water to check for defects. To make forging easier, they pre-lube the slugs before heating them. That's why the slug flames up when struck by the press. It only takes two seconds for the press to do its job. But the forgings are so hot, they need at least an hour to cool before the next step. Workers heat the forgings twice more. The first time at very high heat to strengthen the metal. The second time at a lower heat to stabilize it. Now, they insert each slug in a lathe to give the forging the correct shape for machines that handle it later. These small holes allow oil to flow through to lubricate the piston when it's in use. Another lathe reduces the diameter by 3 millimeters. The same machine then cuts three grooves, two for compression rings and another for an oil control ring. These rings help the piston glide and enable it to provide an airtight seal. This hole is for the wrist pin that will attach the piston to a connecting rod. A milling machine then shaves off up to two centimeters of metal from two sides of the piston to reduce the overall weight. The white liquid is lubricant to cool the area during cutting. Another milling machine cuts away part of what they call the dome. This way, it'll clear other parts when moving inside the cylinder. The pistons must be just the right shape and size. Some of them move up and down as much as 6,000 times per minute when the engine is running. Next, a lathe shaves a hair width more of the metal from the outside. This cut enables the piston to expand slightly when heat builds up inside the cylinder. An automated drill makes two intersecting oil drain holes to enhance lubrication of the wrist pin. Another machine now engraves model and production data. Here, a worker removes sharp edges created during previous operations. He then uses a belt sander to further smooth out the surface. Sharp edges could damage cylinder walls. This cutting machine shaves off a bit of metal inside the pinhole, so the wrist pin will fit snugly inside. Once the cutting is complete, high-pressure jets spray the pistons with hot deionized water. This cleaning removes all traces of lubricant and oil. After a blow-dry with an air gun, 
the Pistons are ready to go through their ups and downs. 